This is Smith Sharp, and you're listening to Navigating Clarity. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Navigating Clarity. We're so excited you're here. Today, we got Pastor Dean Klein joining hey, us. Good morning. It's going to be a great uh, episode with him. He preached yesterday on becoming and making a disciple. Uh, it was a great message. You should check it out if you haven't heard it yet. But I kind of want to circle back to uh, your story and your mm. ministry in Haiti and kind of how that started. And you talked a lot yesterday about Jesus doesn't... Um, call the equipped he Mm -hmm. equips the called and kind of how that started for you and you might definitely probably didn't feel equipped to go or to be in that ministry um, but Jesus was calling you Mm -hmm. to it and how that kind of happened well I think the, the the beautiful thing for me is it didn't happen all at one time and so I, I certainly would not have been ready, you know, if I look at where I'm at now versus where I was at in 2010. Uh, we don't have enough time uh, this morning probably to get into the details of that, but um, how it all happened. But the Lord orchestrated it in a, in a very unique way that all started with um, my youngest son at that time uh, was probably... I'll get in trouble because I may not be accurate. He was probably six or seven, Drew was, and he Googled his name and found a, a Christian artist in Nashville called Drew Klein. And at that time, uh, Discovery was um, tr- trying to come up with a way to raise some money for Safe Harbor. And so we decided to do a concert. We decided to, to ask Drew to come. And at the last minute, I'll never forget, I was in a hotel in Winston. Uh, and I didn't know Drew. We had never met. I called him and he said uh, he could bring a band with him. And we were meeting at the, we were going to have the event at the Salt Block, which is in downtown Hickory, relatively yeah. small venue. And he said he could bring this band with him called uh, Audio Adrenaline that I had never heard of. And um, there's some backstory to that. I didn't know who they were. I had the wrong name. And I called Smith from the hotel and said, Drew's saying we should let this other band come. And I said, that's a horrible idea. We'll mess it up. Um, The venue's too small. We don't have enough time. All the reasons to not do it. And he said, did you say um, audio adrenaline? And I was like, yeah. What, What is, and he said, I followed them all over Kentucky when I got out of college with Charlotte. Long story short, they came, we met them. I don't remember what month it was in 2010. And then later that year, Smith and I and Bob Fincher went to Haiti for the first time. And uh, so that just started this snowball of events and people and Um, just that God orchestrated. And so I could slowly then step into what he wanted me to see and wanted me to try to understand uh, that led me to be a board member and to participate and to go there a couple times a year. And it's just been amazing. And when would you say you understood like that's what he was calling you to? Oh, that's such a good question, Kat. Um, You know, I think the interesting thing for me is I love children. So, um, you know, little babies and little, you know, they start to annoy me when they get to like, (laughs) you know, when you get to 10 and you're running, you know, but man, you, you give me a zero to six or seven. I have just really a soft spot for kids. And so I remember all the way back in 2010, we had a a slightly different, um, hands and feet had a slightly different model with how you interface with children. And we knew less things then than we know now. Today, we, when we go to Haiti, we try to, it's not that we don't want to have contact with them, but we do not want to try to build a relationship with a child in Haiti when you're there for a week because they, they experience abandonment over and over as we had uh, groups go in. Uh, So we try to just be play with them a little bit, but not hold them or, but back in the day in 2010, when you went, uh, we just really, we held babies and they would come. And as you sat on the porches of the houses, they would come sit on your lap and 
look at your phone and take pictures and just so really just fell in love with how beautiful their children are and then how much need there was there and so that's i think for me that's really been the connection from the very beginning and if you look at the history with me and hands and feet it's always been stories of individual children uh, we've had the story of Marlene. We've had the story of Will Darlene and all these. Uh, what we what we really want to do for all, we try to do for one. And so those are the stories that have really impacted me and really made me know that that that's where God wanted me to work. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. So what would you say to someone that? thinks God is calling them somewhere, um, but they definitely don't feel equipped to go. Yeah. Um, or maybe they don't know where God is calling them yet. Yeah. That's a, that's a loaded question. Um, let me answer the, maybe the second part of that first. And I would say that the steps to your calling a lot of times seem inconsequential mm-hmm. and it's like the first step would seem like it would have no impact. So, and, and God can use almost anything, you know, had my son who's was six or seven, whatever, not Googled his name, which is just a weird thing to even do. Uh, Drew Klein, who I'm still friends with today, he's a senior pastor in Little Rock, Arkansas. He had to respond had he not been manning his website email. So all these steps. So, so a lot of things that that God does in our life appear to be consequence or they appear to be just a daily activity, but he's doing something. And I I think so now at a a later age, I, I look at things that happen differently and people who come into my sphere and I, I see them and meet them and they, they have an interest in something. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the second part of the question. This whole idea of equipping and how you, um, you know, how someone who's being called and what the, what their concerns might be about how they're equipped. Um, you know, I just would say you, you don't want to miss out. And I think that's what happens when you doubt yourself, when you doubt what God can do, when you doubt, um, or you question what you have or don't have, you know, all, all I did, and I said it quite a few times yesterday in the messages is to give God something to work with. And that I remember even back in 2010, there were, there were things against us going to Haiti. There was a, the, I think the largest earthquake they had ever had happened, I think in August of that year. And so there were people saying not to go and, you know, we just decided to go anyway. And um, there have been, you know, it's not the easiest place to travel to, uh, but we still go. Um, If we're not going to go, who's going to go? And so I think um, just know that God has a plan and that there can still be goodness in trial and things that are in opposition to you. And just don't worry about what you have or don't have. I mean, if I really focused on what I don't have, there, there would be very little that I would probably do. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's kind of good. You talk about trial um, and kind yeah. of just doing it anyways and hardships. And I feel like oftentimes we get so caught up mm-hmm. in our own hardships. So maybe do you have a story where Ooh, you yeah. got caught up in your own hardship and it kind of kept you from where you felt God was calling you to go? Well, I think that's, I mean, I could probably name 100 of those. Um, and your many years of life. Yeah, <laughs> yes, in my 100 years of life, <laughs> a one per year. Uh, no, I would say, I would almost, I would like to answer that a little bit differently. In that, um, now in my life, I have a real desire to go to Haiti because it changes my perspective on my life. And so too many times I think my problems are really important. I think they're unsolvable and, and in truth, and we all use this phrase, they're, they're, they're first world problems. And so what Haiti has done for me, and I think serving in other ways, um, gives you a perspective 
that you simply do not have if you stay in your own environment. And so for me, um, usually when I leave there, I'm ready to come home um, for various reasons. It's, it's, it can be a, you know, and it's, I'm soft. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough place to go. Um, you know, it's just, it's just tough to be there. Um, and there's a lot of sadness, so it's hard to be there for long periods of time. But, and last time I went was July of this year. I start to feel the need to go back, to have, you know, really my mind reset to understand that, you know, my, my biggest problem for today is just minuscule in comparison to the problems they face every day. You know, we had um, Andrew McGinnis, our executive director, reached out to me. It's probably been a couple weeks ago. And she said a mother showed up at our, our Tozen campus, which was in Grand Guave, Haiti. And, and it was a mother and I think five children. And they hadn't eaten in three, three days. Wow. And so she was um, just at, you know, she was at her wit's end and, you know, babies up to small little children. And there was, there was no food, no um, real opportunity. She didn't know where her food was going to come from. That's a real problem. And that makes my emails and whatever is happening with a customer or a client seem, seem relatively insignificant. And so I think the, the Lord for me knows that I can be a worrier and can really get inwardly focused on my own problems. And so in many ways, Haiti just just solves a lot of problems for me and perspectives one. And so I would say to anybody who um, feels ill-equipped, I mean, I would just say I'm probably one of the least equipped and it's worked out beautifully. <laughs> yeah. You're one of the people um, that balances serving in the church, yeah. being on the board for the hands and feet and running a business um, so well. And kind of how would you... <laughs> I don't know that I do it well. It looks great to me. As long as it looks good to you, I'm good. Okay. Because um, ha we have to work. Like yeah. you still have to have an income and provide. And so you couldn't just drop it all and go... No live like live in Haiti or be full-time hands and feet because you had a family and three kids to provide for sure. so how would you say you balance all that and prioritizing like God's calling on your life but still managing a successful business oh goodness gracious cat um well the way I explain you know people I guess maybe a way I can answer is people ask me what I do you know if you meet a stranger they say well what do you what do you do and I say I have three jobs, and um, they're just in different buckets with different percentages of my time. And, um, you know, I think for men, a lot of times, our job is who we are. And I think that's, that can be very dangerous. And so I try to make sure my job is just what I do. Uh, it's important. I have employees, and, and it, it, you know, for... Uh, much of my work career, uh, we wanted Paige to stay home. So I wanted my wife to be able to stay home. My mom stayed home. And, and so we were able to do that. But that meant um, my job. I traveled a lot um, when my kids were little. And, and we gave up things to, to try to support our family. But I think what happened is that God... Really, just the older I got, he, he pulled me in different directions. So um, I think if Discovery's, what, 15 years old, roughly? 16, yeah. 16 years old. So, yeah, I was 38 when I came to Discovery uh, for the first time. And then I was 40 when I connected with Hands and Feet. So I was really in my late 30s. And, you know, maybe just in God's wisdom, he just knew that I would be a person that would be really singularly focused and could maybe have problems with work and it being too important. And so he, he pulled me in different directions. And so for me, again, um, church is a is a huge diversion for me. And I would say at this point in my life, I just get more out of I, I get more more fulfillment out of church and hands and feet. I still, I still need a job. 
still important, but now those percentages are shifting. And so where work was 100% for all those years, you know, is it, is it 70% and, and probably discovery is 15% and hands and feet is 15%. But I can see, uh, you know, as I, as I approach um, 60, the big 60, which is going to be horrific, it's gonna uh, be great. <laughs> that, you know, I can, I can play with those percentages and, and where I'm most needed and where I can have the greatest impact is where I can spend my time, which is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like a lot of people try and balance, like they can't figure out how to balance their work versus what God is calling them to. But oftentimes in your, do you ever see in your work, you can kind of shift towards where God is calling you to as well? Yeah. I, I think again, I mentioned yesterday in my message to young people to not wait until they're old like me to know what God's trying to do. And so um, we, we're called to be a disciple in everything we do. So it's not like there's a, a work dean, a church dean, and a hands and feet dean. There's, there's not three of me with different personalities and different desires. You know, when I get up in the morning, God wants me to work for the kingdom. And so whether that is through an email to a client or a customer, whether it's coming over here to do a podcast with you or Andrea calls me later and we have an issue on the ground in Haiti, I tend to be a yes person. So if somebody calls, I, t I tend to say yes, which can be a problem because you can get spread kind of thin. But I think now in my life, I look at that as it's an opportunity. You know, Kat calling me to do a podcast or we need to do a video about something or can you come over and look at something? You know, I just have one life. It's all mixed up. It's all opportunities for God to show me something or to teach me something or for me to share what's going on in my life with somebody else. So I think it just as you mature, you just see that it's all one thing. And so almost like your perspective, um, it kind of goes along with my last question I had. Your perspective has switched from being overwhelmed to just looking at it as an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I'm still overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, it's still, um, you know, if you focus on just the, the moment of the day, it can be overwhelming. I think it's when you look back. Um, the, it's hard. It's really hard sometimes just to see what God's doing. You know, I don't, I don't know. Do you always see what God's doing in your life? You know, it's, <laughs> it's so, it's so challenging. But now when I look back, um, when I look back from, from Drew Googling his name, that now, um, I serve on the board of the organization and it's like, it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible. Like there's no amount of money or effort that I could expend to make that happen. Like you just can't, you can't make it happen. And I remember, um, when I first, when the, when we did the first concert, we did actually two concerts with, with audio a, but we did a, I think it was the first one we had to move it because of audio adrenaline coming with Drew Klein and it was going to snow. The, the concert was at the Broyhill Center in Lenore. And as we got close, like Tuesday of that week and the concert was Friday or Saturday, um, it was going to be 32 and snowing on the day of the concert. And so I remember getting with Smith and I was like, we're going to have to cancel like going up into Lenore and we were renting the venue and we were paying and we still had to try to make money to give to safe Harbor. And so we really thought we would have to cancel. And it was the first time I called Will McGinnis. I didn't know who he was. He had never met me. And we had a difficult conversation because I was like, I, I think we're going to have to cancel. And he was like, well, you can't cancel because we've rented a tour bus and we've rented equipment and we're coming. So you're going to have to pay us whether you have the concert or not. And I remember calling Smith and saying, um, we're going to have it 
even if it's just me and you and we're the only people there. And from that, I had this impression of like who Will McGinnis was. I was like, this guy's, you know, he's kind of, he can be mean. (laughs) (laughs) And he's literally like the sweetest soul you could ever meet. And you just look at all these things that, and it's now funny that that day I was overwhelmed. Now, because we were just trying and we're giving God something to work with. And I remember that morning, the morning of the concert, getting up and it was like 35 degrees. And I was like, it's not 32. It's not going to freeze. People can get there. We had like 600 people and we raised $10,000 for Safe Harbor. That's awesome. I was overwhelmed that day. But, you know, the story ends up being great because we we just stepped out in faith without knowing how to do a concert without knowing the people and god did the rest so it was beautiful you really just got to step out into where you're called (laughs) you have to step out yes ma'am well thanks for joining me today yeah it was a lot of fun it was great seeing you all we'll see you next week all right take care